Yeah, hello. Um, really good to be here today. Um, to lay the grounds for this talk, um, I decided to sp uh, it was worth to spread other people's ideas to start with. Um, so what you're looking at behind me here um, is part of a series of experiments uh, that were done, uh, executed in the 1940s by a team called Haida and Simmel. And they found that none of you here in the room can actually look at the, this low-resolution crazy movement here without attaching qualitative judgment to this. So you will either think it's threatening or you will perceive them as, asso uh, um, uh, uh, as associating with each other or antagonistic. Um, but you can't look at that and, uh, uh, very easily to and make it abstract or look at it as abstract information. Um, and this is hardwired into our brains. This is working across cultures. And um, it is something that for us or di didn't stop f uh, fascinating us um, since we first saw this. Us, that's um, myself, uh, Stuart Wood, who's here in the front, and Florian Ortkas. Um, we are London-based uh, uh, collective, and we work on uh, large and increasingly immersive uh, installations. Um, and I'm going to talk about one specific installation today, which was called Future Self, which was commissioned uh, here in Berlin by uh, an entity called Made Space um, in May this year. Um, and to start with, I'm going to show a little bit more um, about the background of this. Um, Again, I'm still spreading other people's ideas, and I'm inviting a neuroscientist to the stage, in a way, who has something very interesting to say about motion and movement. I'm a neuroscientist, and in neuroscience, we have to deal with many difficult questions about the brain. But I want to start with the easiest question, and a question you really should have all asked yourself at some point in your life, because it's a fundamental question if we want to understand brain function. And that is, why do we and other animals have brains? Not all species on our planet have brains, so if we want to know what the brain is for, let's think about why we evolved one. Now, you may reason that we have one to perceive the world or to think, and that's completely wrong. If you think about this question for any length of time, it's blindingly obvious why we have a brain. We have a brain for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce adaptable and complex movements. There is no other reason to have a brain. Think about it. Movement is the only way you have of affecting the world around you. That's not quite true. There's one other way, and that's through sweating. But apart from that, Everything else goes through contractions of muscles. So think about communication, speech, gestures, writing, sign language. They're all mediated through contractions of your muscles. So it's really important to remember that sensory, memory, and cognitive processes are all important, but they're only important to either drive or suppress future movements. I think that's pretty powerful, uh, uh, powerful information. Um, of course, we're not scientists. Um, we're artists, and we're, we're more interested in, in what motion and seeing movement and perceiving movement does to us. Um, how motion triggers emotion in the viewer, um, how simulated natural behavior um, affects us and evokes emotion when simulation starts to become reality is something, it's sort of a subplot, which is really interesting, and what it all does to us as, as human beings. Um, this is another snippet which I found which had a pretty powerful impact on myself. Uh, two things, one, it's a Boston Dynamics DARPA-funded military robot here. Two things are interesting here, I think. One is that people can actually make stuff like this. We immediately perceive it as something alive, I think, or at least I do, uh, without that thing resembling anything in particular. Is it a dog, a horse, a sheep? What is it? But through motion only, we think it's alive. And the second thing is that I feel really sorry for that thing when it's get kicked. And I don't know if you feel the same, but I, I think that's, that's something really interesting. And. We came to these questions and to these, these themes through a first installation, which we did a few years ago, called Audience, which was commissioned by um, this guy, Wayne McGregor, who's a choreographer. Now, 
Florian and Stuart and myself are not very sort of physical people. We sit on laptops and build stuff. Um, and this is contemporary dance performance, uh, using the body and the body only to create art. And that was something very new for us and really challenged us to, to devise something. So he wanted us to create an installation um, that would engage uh, visitors at the Royal Opera House. So we came up with this idea of lots of little head-sized mirrors which pick random members of the audience um, and then follow them around and then drop them and pick somebody else. Um, and this was the first installation, the first time we installed it at the, at the Royal Opera House. And it had an amazing physical effect on people. Uh, you, it really reversed the role of, of installation versus viewer. So the installation stopped performing. It just responded to people. Um, and the people started to perform and really got out or, or into themselves, really. Uh, this is the way we, we show and develop this work now as installation work in galleries and museums and so on. Um, so it's more of an immersive, uh, uh, immersive environment. And um, so they all turn their head and then follow you around. You see yourself 64 times. And at that point, we didn't really think much about these themes of motion and emotion and, and uh, uh, things like that. What we did find out, however, was that it was crucially important to model the behavior of these little guys in a way that they stopped being robotic and started to remotely resemble somebody's head. Um, because the first time we did it, uh, that was the first prototype. It was a very shaky guy and um, didn't, have, didn't evoke much emotion in, in, in us. Um, so Stuart started to do behavior modeling, very basic. That guy's looking for a lost context lens. So all these 64 mirrors had, I think, five or six little different modes, uh, which, they, um, which they employed when nobody was around so that people felt that they're engaging with an actual group of little characters. From that, we started to be really interesting in, uh, interested in, in movement. And the next one was uh, swarm behavior, flocks of birds. I think we all know these YouTube videos. I think our interest got sparked through a, a, a video which Stuart uh, watched, which was a Carling bear ad which showed a flock of birds. Um, and it's an incredible efficiency of movement, hundreds of thousands of objects flying in a beautiful and beautifully efficient choreography without crashing, without clashing. Um, so this was something we were absolutely desperate to try to embody in some sort of installation. Of course, the, the, the best thing would be to embody it kinetically, like with real objects, but that proved uh, a little too difficult at that point. So we came up with this idea of um, you know, building a light installation around an algorithm which simulates swarm behavior in a very simple way. And um, this is the first iteration of it. Uh, the previous images was a large one of these installations in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, and this is what it does. So it's a, it's a um, most of the of the environment in which this algorithm lives uh, is invisible, actually, and some of it is embodied by I think this is 9,000 light points. Um, and we developed the driver system uh, because it has to run at an incredibly high frame rate. Um, I think 60 frames per second to be to move organically. And this is not an animation. So this is the actual live algorithm running in there. Um, and from that on, we started to become even more interested in movement, motion, and these uh, uh, themes. So we uh, decided to invite some people who can tell us more about it. One of the guys is uh, Phil Barnett. He um, is a, a cognitive scientist who was working at the Brain Sciences Unit at Cambridge University who had worked with Main, Wayne McGregor on, on projects. And the other guy was uh, uh, Joss Knight from a company called Natural Motion. And they design gaming characters and do some incredible work, which I'm showing. So th the questions were the same. How does motion to, to these guys? How, how motion triggers emotion? When does simulation become live? Um, so borderlining on first questions around artificial intelligence and sentience and so on, and what, what it does to us. Um, hoping that it would sort of give us more precise ideas, maybe refine our work. And Phil Barnett, for example, told us, using some, something like this from Biomotion Lab, he told us how little 
information, and I think that's fascinating, how little information our brain requires to make something out as human and natural. So, you know, I've, I've pre-recorded this, so, you know, by changing very, very slight uh, uh, parameters in, this, in these few dots moving, we immediately can uh, differentiate between male and female and nervous and happy and sad and so on. Um, which, of course, if you, for us, is super important information if we design installations where we want to use things like that. Yeah. Uh, and then incredible, natural motion. They design middleware for games. So, um, again, you know, they make, they make stuff in gaming move and behave like actual living beings. Um, and he pointed out something which really caught my, my attention. Um, he pointed out that as long as we don't get any gaze reaction from our opposite, we don't feel particularly inclined to engage. But as soon as somebody, if, as, as the gaze of your opposite is, is reacting to you, you bang, you're, you're there. You're, you, know, you feel that you, this, this person will have much more of a presence in your perception. And that was something which, which we thought was incredibly Incredibly interesting. So with this, with this information, um, we we wanted to work with, yeah, sort of translate that again into away from the screen into something more physical. Um, so we came up with a, with a, a concept that asked these questions: Can we predict and perhaps even dictate people's movement? That was one of the initial questions for the future self installation. Um, so we came up with it using the same technology as the swarm light, a, 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 a fully controllable 3D matrix of, of light points. Uh, we decided we, it was really time for us to engage with a full body, so in, away from you know, abstracted movement or swarm movement to the human actual uh, uh, shape and form and experience of the human body in space. So this is um, basically a very early sketch for a 3D mirror, which the future self sort of is. So we needed to find out how to capture the information of a real person in front of the installation uh, using industrialized and further developed versions of a Kinect camera, of a 3D camera. Um, and then um, we engaged with MadeSpace, who uh, are in Berlin. They commissioned multidisciplinary art project. Um, so it wasn't only us creating this work, but we were asked to you know, see if we can invite other artists to collaborate. And of course, um, Wayne McGregor came to mind. It was wonderful to, for us to commission him to uh, develop some real aesthetic movement around an installation piece like that. And um, Max Richter, who uh, we stole all the mu music from for our YouTube videos, was a, a delight to work with, so we invited him and commissioned him to write the score for that. And then we uh, started building the piece, which was a nine or ten months process. Incredibly la laborious. It's the biggest, most light points we've ever used. It's 30,000 LEDs hand soldered onto little circuit boards, um, all pr pretty much handmade in the UK. Um, and this is the first actual test in the made space um, to, to see how this whole thing behaves in space and what it does. It is a three dimensional mirror, it accurately uh, gives. Your, your, your shape, it can delay that information, and it has not one but two 3D cameras, one each side, because that's also something we, we thought was interesting, to challenge the choreographer to choreograph two physical bodies in one physical space in the middle. So um, that's what we felt was necessary to make it interesting for, for Wayne to, to work with this. And um, yeah, I'm going to show you the, it's a four minute film, so I'm gonna step aside for you to watch it with a score by Max Richter. The whole uh, performance uh, had a duration of, I think, 10 minutes, um, but here you go.
So this was Future Self. If you want to see this live, um, the next time it's going to be uh, performed is going to be in Paris on the 18th of October. It's uh, going to be up in the gallery at Capitus Workshop Gallery there for, from September 8th onwards for, until Christmas. But the McGregor performance with the dancers will happen on Thursday, October 18th. Um, our future works, if you happen to be in London, uh, it's a vast installation called Rain Room. I just came back yesterday from the first tests of it. It's just going to be in the Barbican. It's a 100 square meter space in which it permanently rains, and wherever you walk, it'll keep you dry. And all the additional stuff that you can do with such a thing. So we've just found out that we can actually run QuickTime movies on that thing. So if you happen to be in London, it's going to be up until March 2013. And um, thank you very much.